All right, welcome everybody. We'll go ahead and uh, get started here today. Uh, welcome to our second Why Zoominar. Uh, today's topic is going to be dissipation, parameterization, and spectral wave models. Um, today, our first speaker will be Leonella, sorry, Leonel Romero uh, from the University of Connecticut. And our second speaker is Matias Aldai from TU Delft and LOPS. And so today, um, our format will be, we'll have uh, two 20 minute talks with questions after each. Um, and if you would like to make an announcement, um, sorry, uh, you can use this uh, email here um, to announce anything. And then just a friendly reminder, these Zoominars are recorded and will be shared um, online. So you are agreeing to that by uh, staying in the meeting here. And just a quick friendly reminder, if you're not speaking, uh, please go on mute. And without further ado, we'll get started with our first speaker, uh, Ionel uh, Romero from the University of Connecticut. The title of his talk today is Empirical Constraints and Validation Metrics for Spectral Wind Wave Models in Idealized Conditions. All right, we can see your screen. Um, I cannot hear you yet if you were speaking. Mute. Okay, now I'm unmuted. I had to go back. Yes, we can hear you now. Do you see the right screen? Correct, we can see the right screen. So awesome. take it away. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you for the invitation. And notice that I changed my title. Now it's surface wave breaking impacts on spectral bimodality and mean square slopes. So again, thank you also for Fabrice for sending that email yesterday just to give a little overview of what I'm gonna be talking about. And on the left, I have a AI generated image from this DALI open AI with the query hand drawn wave in storm conditions in the open ocean. So I thought you would like it, so I figured I would share it. If you haven't given it a shot, try it. It's a lot of fun until you realize that it has some limits. So you can kind of understand how it actually works when you start pushing the limits. Okay, so today I'm gonna to be talking about my parameterization um, of wave breaking published in GRL in 2019. And I'll go over all the empirical metrics that were used to basically guide and constrain um, the dissipation and also what are the impacts on other metrics that were not um, kept track of during the development, but yet it created, it resulted in significant improvements and specifically the crosswind mean square slope and the azimuthal overlap integral, which are important for the, the prediction of microseisms uh, in the ocean. So first I'd like to point out some of the generalities um, across different parametrizations, uh, ST4, ST6, and my parametrization. They all depend nonlinearly on the saturation. Um, which was motivated by some of the work by Banner and then Alves and Banner um, were the first ones to start using parametrizations of su such kind where you have a threshold and above that value breaking begins. Lower than a certain value, you don't have breaking. We all also have a cumulative effect, which accounts for long wave, short wave interactions. And Yes, they're all crude approximations to some extent, and therefore we need a lot of measurements either directly or indirectly to constrain um, our formulation and model performance as much as possible. And what's really different about my parametrization compared to ST4 and ST6 is really the relatively narrow directional distribution um, of the dissipation itself, and, as, um, and which actually couples with the wave-wave interactions and enhances the bimodality and increases the spreading of the spectrum. So 
my formulation is within the framework of Phillips 1985, who introduced this lambda of C distribution, which is the length of breaking fronts moving with velocity C to DC per unit surface area. And one of the advantages of that framework is that the different moments of that distribution relate to different parameters or processes related to breaking. In particular, the fifth moment scaled by this proportionality factor, little b, which is the strength of breaking, is directly related to the energy dissipation per unit area. And in this work, I am working under the premise that the spectrum is generally composed of two regimes. You have a K to the minus 2.5, your equilibrium range where wind input, wave wave interactions and dissipation are of about the same order of magnitude. And then you have a saturation range where it transitions from K to the minus 2.5 to K to the minus three. And there the primary balance as suggested by Phillips 84 is between the wind input and the dissipation. So in the bottom, I'm basically showing you the, the scaled compensated saturated spectrum times K cube. So now the blue part is horizontally, and this is supported by broadband measurements in the wave number domain by Lenine and Melville in 2017. So my formulation of the lambda of C distribution has basically three components. First, it has a scaling that depends on this two-dimensional saturation, which comes out the, on, from Gaussian statistics of the lens of crest exceeding wave look criterion. It's work that I did with Ken in 2011, following the work by Long at Higgins in 1957. So it's basically Gaussian statistics. In addition, it has a modulation due to long wave, short wave interaction, this M sub L. And following the work by Donnellan and some of the work by Peru et al. and Guimares, it's in terms of the cumulative mean squared slope. I also have a factor here, which is a cosine factor to the power of two, and then an additional power to the three halves here and this scaling factor of 400. Now, theta sub w is the mean wave direction. So this is saying that the waves predominantly break in the direction of the average wave direction, which by the way, actually did, I actually didn't ch change this one, which is weighted more towards the longer dominant waves. So that's just a caveat. These numbers uh, were selected such that the performance of the bimodality gave the best agreement with the LIDAR observations. And you can come up with different combinations of these 400 with different powers of the cosine, and you can get similar results. I just wanna point that out. Then there's an additional modulation component directly due to the wind. And this was needed in order to balance the wind input within the saturation range. And it is linear with, with, wave, with wave number, and it is turned on at a wave number K naught, which depends on the friction velocity, okay? And again, this is needed basically to, to get the data to agree with the empirical level of saturation at high wave numbers. And just to summarize, M sub L controls the directional spreading and the bimodality of the spectrum, whereas M sub W controls basically the level of the saturation at high wave numbers. And this K naught back in 2010, when, when I was working with Ken on a different form of the parameterization, basically with the Alves and Banner um, parameterization corrected at, at, at higher wave numbers, we were using a different wave number that was not dependent on wind speed. We were basically using the zero up crossing of the wave wave interactions, which worked pretty well. So we could replace this weak wind dependence of K naught by using the zero crossing of the wave wave interactions. The problem with that is that you were stuck with only using the WRT, that is the exact wave wave interactions where the zero clock crossing is well behaved. If you try to use the zero crossing with the DIA, you're, you're not gonna get anywhere because there's gonna be multiple zero crossings all over the place. So it really came out of 
practicality and being able to run this model with the DIA, which is why I chose to introduce this weak dependence on wind speed. Okay, so here is the final form of the dissipation model. We have our lambda of C, then we have our strength of braking, which I'm using the parametrization that we developed in 2012 in a semi-empirical fashion. Um, and the power of five halves comes from the inertial scaling by Drazen et al. in 2008. So I ran a series of experiments for, for duration limited cases, and I tuned the model so I matched significant wave height and peak wave period against ST4 with the DIA. And I do this for both the DIA, the approximate wave-wave interactions, and the exact web ratio tracing. So here are examples of the one-dimensional spectrum that develops. By the way, we're integrating the spectrum across the wave numbers that we resolve. We do not attach a tail, a parametric tail halfway through our spectrum. We are integrating the spectrum throughout the, the range of wave numbers that I'm resolving. The dashed lines are DIA solutions. The solid lines are WRT solutions. And we approximately develop this K to the minus three at high wave numbers and K to minus 2.5 at lower wave numbers. We have these two power law regime. On the right, I'm showing you the saturation compensated spectrum. So this is a K to the 0 0.5, K to the 1 half, and it's flattened out here. And notice if you zoom in and you, you would argue, well, it's not exactly a K to the minus 2.5 and it's not exactly a K to the minus 3, that's true. But on average, it's following these two trends. And we're matching at, in the high wind regime around 15 meter per second matching the saturation level observed by uh, Romero and Melville in, in the Gulf of the Wind effect and Lenine and Melville 2017, which was not much dependence on the wind speed once you get into the higher wind speed regime. And the equilibrium range is in very good agreement with the scaling by ratio at all in 2004, which was uh, some wave age dependence. Now, looking into the directionality of the spectrum, so this is the half width or the directional spreading from the solutions plotted as a function of scale. Here I'm, is the wave number normalized by the peak wave number. So these are solutions for the DIA, the WRT, and the measurements from the Gulf of the Wantepec. And you can notice that if you like step back and look at the WRT solution and the observations qualitatively, they follow similar patterns, yet the data are very noisy, so keep that in mind. But the DIA shows much narrower trend with wave age, but nevertheless are qualitatively similar of how, on how wide they are. And especially for the WRT solutions, this is a big, improvement over previous efforts. Uh, in 2010, when we were using the Alves and Banner formulation with WRT solutions, the directional spreading would just uh, asymptote around 30 degrees and we couldn't get anything wider. So it's significant improvement by having a narrow dissipation function leading to wider spectrum overall. Now, looking at the directional distribution itself, it's, it's, it's been known for a while that the spectrum is bimodal. And so at the, at the spectral peak is unimodal, moving towards lower and higher wave numbers. It bifurcates into these, these two lows. Here I'm showing you solutions from the DIA on the top. So this is angle, and the vertical is the wave number divided by the peak. So this is one is around here. In the bottom is the solution from the WRT. So you can clearly see that the WRT has much cleaner bimodality and also more enhanced bimodality. You can see lighter colors here in the center part of our figure. And what's happening is because the, non, the, the, the dissipation is narrower, it's taking more energy from this center region and it's allowing these lobes to build up over time, which is why it's coupling to the wave-wave interactions and enhancing 
the bimodality overall. And again, this is a, a great improvement over previous efforts using the WRT, where the, the amplitude of the bimodality and the lobe separation tended to be significantly lower than the observations. So now I'm going to show you quantitatively. So this is the half width of the separation of the lobes plotted as a function of scale, color coded by wave age. And on the right is the amplitude. So it's, it's how, how, what's the amplitude relative to the center of the spectrum, this R lobe. And the solutions for the WRT show clear trends with wave age. And when we scale the data by the square root of the wave age, the data collapses along these lines that were reported from the Gulf of the Wantepec measurements. And notice that the amplitude is a little, there's a small bias low at K over KP between two and four, but overall is doing a pretty good job uh, in reproducing the observations. If we do the same for the DIA, um, the low separation is still very good, but the low amplitude, although the trend holds and it collapses, there is a significant bias low because the magnitude of the lobes is, is very weak compared to the WRT. Now looking further into the mean square slopes. So these are all solutions that resolve wave numbers out to 10 radians per meter. And I am integrating the mean square slope over the resolved wave numbers. And here I'm plotting the mean square slope as a function of wind speed color coded by wave age. And in green, I'm showing you the measurements by Cox and Monk in slick conditions, meaning they do not have the gravity capillary waves. It's not clear how you would separate, but what gravity wave scale you would separate the slick case. But nevertheless, this comparison is qualitative, but it seems to be consistent. Now, this is by components. So this is the downwind mean square slope versus wind speed. And on the right is the crosswind mean square slope versus the wind speed. And again, both were doing a relatively good job at reproducing the Cox and Monk. And if anything, maybe an overestimation once the waves get fairly old. And more importantly, if we look at the ratio, the cross mean, mean square slope divided by the downwind, so this is for the DIA versus wind speed. This is for the WRT versus wind speed. Uh, my DIA results are starting to exceed the variability reported by Cox and Monk, whereas the WRT results are well within the variability observed by Cox and Monk. And when you compare the same metric against the standard ST4 and ST6, both ST4 and ST6 give much, much lower values of the crosswind mean square slope. And again, this has important implications for the prediction of microseisms, which are directly proportional to the overlap azimuthal integral. So it's given by this equation right here, which basically gives you how much a measure of the energy that is going in opposite directions. So here I'm showing you solutions of this overlap integral in near conditions of fully developed seas or CP over U star around 28, color coded by wind speed. And the dash line is showing um, the semi-empirical model by Donibir et al. in 2012. So we can see that at intermediate scales, our solutions with WRT are approaching the semi-empirical model, whereas both ST4 and ST6 would give at least two orders of magnitudes lower azimuthal integral compared to my solutions. And when you look at the directional, the directional distribution of these dissipation function. So this is my parametrization ST4 and ST6. It's clearly narrower than the other two. 
Now, if you were to compute, compute the actual the half width across the page, you would find that are actually very similar, despite the fact that they look different because these values out here are so low that they contribute very little to the actual computation of the half width. So what is different is that the half width of my dissipation function is about 15 degrees narrower than the spreading of my energy spectrum. Whereas the half width of the dissipation function ST4 and ST6 is exactly equal to the spreading function, the spread, the half width of the energy spectrum that they produce. So it's really the difference, the narrowness of the dissipation relative to the spectrum that then allows it to couple to the wave wave interactions. And finally, I just want to share that we also validate, I also validated against the field measurements of Lambda by Sutherland and Melville. This is one-to-one -one comparisons in terms of wind speed. If I normalized uh, the way they did it with HS, U star, and CP, my lambdas collapsed along the line that they reported. And is now allowing us to look at other processes. We can look at white cap coverage versus wind speed. We can also look at wave current interactions. I'm currently investigating what is the impact on gas transfers. You have a strong inhomogeneities. So in collaboration with Luke Deca, uh, we're starting to look at these sort of processes and see if there's an impact on CO2 fluxes. So I'm gonna leave it at that. Clearly we need more observations and we need to know how do we dissipate this extra energy that is going to very large angles. And so we ultimately are gonna to have to look at the gravity capillary waves as a source of dissipation to get rid of this energy that is going at pretty large angles. And I'll leave it at that since I'm already at 20 minutes and 30 seconds. All right, perfect timing. Thank you so much. Um, I will open the floor to questions. You can either uh, raise your hand or type it in the chat if you would prefer. Oh, Pedro? Hey. Are you hi, Romero. Uh, Pedro Guimarães is talking. Oh, hi there. Uh, very nice to hear your talk. I'm very happy that uh, I see somehow the, what I did in my PhD there. <laughs> um, so I, I have a question about your ML uh, term. And um, I was wondering, you, you, you told that uh, you, did so, you did some experimental with radar, right? With radar? Yeah, you, 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 you did some experiments for to, to get like this 400 number in the, the mean square row, no, no? No, with and radar, no, just empirically just tried how I can ah, okay. get it by modalities, right? Okay, 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 okay. And uh, so my question is, how do you think this could be used for all of the uh, spectral conditions from different wind seas and different uh, wave seas and everything? Or or it's something that uh, it's more like just for some experiments that, uh, do you think this is general, this 400 number? Oh, I, I don't think it's, it's, it's unique. It's just, it's just a specific for the combination of all the other parameters that I have. If you were trying to apply it to okay. a different model, then it it's gonna be a different combination. And it's not unique because you can play with the 400 and the powers to achieve similar yeah. results. So it's really yeah, ad hoc yeah. um, results driven, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because and, I, I, yeah. Sorry, sorry. No, and and this dependence on the long wave direction, I think it's it's. It, I I think it's gonna break at some point, right? I think that. Yeah, maybe the, the way the breaking is tied to the long waves up to a certain point, but at some point the wind is probably gonna be the dominant controlling factor in the directionality of. So I think that this is gonna depend on directionality as well, on, on scale of where is the dominant direction where things break to. Okay, yeah, th this number was puzzling me for like many years because I thought, well, I, I always thought that this would not be constant, but maybe they are, why not? <laughs> so I, I was just wondering if you have some uh, experiment or something that uh, proved that or not. I'm oh. hoping to do measurements to to tackle that problem. Yeah. I'm looking at like broadband measurements and 
especially you're going to misalign wind and waves. I think it could shed some light into these problems. All right. Yeah, I, I, I put online a few hundred of data that uh, of terabytes of data that uh, with a lot of uh, breaking events. So if you are interested to take a look on that, uh, that results, I will be happy to help you with that. I, I've been working with some of that data, developing the 3D measurements of Lambda and looking at the bimodality. So I'll, I'll reach out to you. Awesome. But yeah, I've been, we've been working on that in my lab recently. Awesome, awesome. I wanna do more measurements. Thank you a lot, Romero. Nice talk. I think we have our uh, next question from Alvise. As your audio it says it's connecting. Yes, it's uh, it's actually okay. Fabrice. Uh, just a comment. Oh. I'm sure you're aware of the paper by Tyler et al. Also looking at the uh, uh, HF radar type of uh, Bragg scattering direction. So people are using that for wind direction, but the ratio of the waves going away and towards the HF radars give you some measure of um, how much energy is in the opposite direction. I think at some point it would be good if somebody look at all that data to kind of um, put some more constraints on these directional spectra. I don't know if you thought about that too. That sounds great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I haven't, I quickly look at the paper, but yeah, I, I think it's a yeah. good idea. Yeah, Tyler 74 here yeah. with Walter Monk. All right, do we have any other questions? Alvise? No, no, I was here with Fabrice. That was I don't oh, know. I Hi. Okay, um, we will move on to our next speaker so we can have some time at the very end uh, for discussion. Uh, thank you so much again, Lionel. And uh, next up, we have uh, Matthias Alday. The title of his Alday, um, his talk is uh, titled <laughs> "Effects of Adjustments to Swell Dissipation and Influence of Breaking Parameterizations on Energy Directionality." I'm going to share my screen. Is that okay for you guys? Yes, we can see your screen. You can see my screen. Awesome. Um, I'm going to put that. I guess it's yeah, better for so everyone. Yeah. So okay. Uh, well, Leonel saved me a lot of explanation <laughs> along the way. So pretty cool. Um, yeah, let's start. I'm going to divide my talk in um, two sections. And the first one, I'm, um, I'll talk about the effects of adjustments in the swell dissipation parameterization from uh, Arthur et al. Uh, 2010, uh, looking at global scales. And on the second part, I'll talk about the effects of the wave breaking parameterization that uh, Romero uh, developed and was reflected in into the ST4 uh, Watch Free package. Um, yeah, so we're going to see some idealized cases and then some actual um, global um, global scale and basin scale uh, models. So just a recap, in spectral models, we describe wave evolution and propagation using the wave balance equation, you know, the old trusty one that we have here. Uh, on the right-hand uh, side, we have all the source times uh, parameterizations trying, trying to describe uh, physical processes. Um, let's, uh, right now, let's focus on these two, um, um, which, uh, which uh, are containing what I call the ERC interaction parameterizations, and uh, which include the wave growth term, this one here, and the dissipation term to account for the loss of wave energy into the atmosphere. Uh, uh, this term also considers two, uh, two parts. The, uh, it uh, makes a transition, or it kind of takes into account the transition between a viscous boundary layer and turbulent boundary layer over uh, the, the weights. And, uh, also provides some weight to uh, balance their effect into the uh, overall anticipation effect. Uh, just a bit of context here. What I'm showing, uh, at some point we're creating a global database uh, with improved force and fields, standard frequency ranges, and higher directional resolution. So um, a lot of uh, adjustments had to be um, done. Uh, um, we basically first focused on uh, reducing biases and errors along uh, um, you know, the whole range of scale of uh, wave heights. And um, just to give a little form of uh, context, we uh, were in, uh, doing some uh, long track analysis comparing with uh, altimetry data, okay? So 
uh, after doing this uh, different tests and adjustments uh, where we define that, okay, this is actually doing pretty well in terms of performance globally, we start to pay attention to the um, uh, wave heights distribution, okay? So if you see this, like in panel A, if you see this, like most of uh, these different tests, it doesn't matter what uh, they mean, just pay attention to the whole overall distribution. They are pretty much the same. It doesn't say much. But actually once uh, you see the difference of the distribution that you get from the altimeter and uh, the results from, uh, from the model, uh, uh, then you start seeing differences uh, that are actually interesting. So uh, let's pay attention, for example, to this test one here that I'm highlighting compared to one of the previous ones, the initial ones. And as you see already with the previous adjustments, we managed to reduce actually the differences of um, occurrences compared to the altimetry in the neighborhood of the two meters wave height. But to lower, um, towards lower wave heights, we have a super high underestimation of occurrences. So, <clears throat> uh, yeah. So we started thinking again, we need to fix this somehow. And that's when uh, uh, we um, uh, adjusted the uh, S7 uh, tunable parameter and the uh, critical renals that play um, a role in this balance in terms of taking into account the triple anticipation and the uh, linear or like viscous one. And taking uh, as a starting uh, base uh, this uh, parameterization, the T471 test uh, that you can actually see here in this uh, publication. Uh, what I did was starting to reduce the critical renals and increase the S7 parameter, which actually what it does is kind of like expands the um, uh, the transition between viscous to um, um, turbulent uh, dissipation, uh, which is pretty much what we try to do to emulate this uh, Right, the distribution, Rally distribution of uh, wave heights with triple boundary layer uh, over the largest waves and viscous boundary layer over the you know group of smaller wave heights. And a uh, few again take into account this just these two examples, the same test we're looking here versus the final uh, set of parameterizations we proposed, what we call test 475. We actually managed to decrease the overestimation of uh, the occurrences of wave heights in the neighborhood of two meters and actually also decrease this underestimation that we had before here in the, close to the 1.5 meters. That correction also, uh, also helped to um, improve some bias um, uh, reduction here in the neighborhood of the two meters uh, wave height, also, of course. And uh, yeah, short and sweet about this. Um, so what you take home from this, like for this model prioritization of these interactions, it is possible to use the wave height distribution, you know, close to the peak of uh, occurrences to adjust the transition from laminar to turbulent boundary layer above the waves. And um, actually this effect uh, is very important for the attenuation of swells. Uh, we think it's one of the main uh, processes to for the Raleigh distribution of wave heights. Now uh, let's go back to what uh, Leonel was talking about. Uh, let's focus on the energy loss to the ocean, the, the, the wave breaking. So um, yeah, I don't think I, um, I'm going to go quickly um, um, about this uh, expression without need to go into me any details. Uh, this is the expression from Macron et al. 2010, which is in the SC4 package that uh, Leonel mentioned before. It is a saturation-based parameterization that also includes the cumulative term to account for smoothing of the surface to, to the big breakers, wiping out uh, uh, smaller waves. Um, as Lionel mentioned before, the spectral saturation is typically just to characterize the wave breaking. And in this case, where uh, this parameterization uses a modified um, saturation um, expression that is partially integrated into a, a band of uh, the directional um, angles. And also, it uh, uses a threshold, a saturation bridge, uh, threshold that's a characteristic of uh, breaking waves. Now, um, Let's uh, take a look at the figure on the right, uh, because actually one of the main motivations that took us, um, you know, to start looking, analyzing, or um, like checking alternative in wave breaking comes from this general example here, where you can see, um, yeah, 
let's say um, one of the main processes uh, that, it, that are included in the uh, in the source terms. Uh, um, input, the nonlinear interactions, and dissipation of energy. And if you see here, uh, down here, the uh, the black, I'm sorry, the red um, line, that it's the total um, source term um, shape, you see that it's slightly positive here on the high frequencies after, you know, like 14 hours running this idealized sea state with that constant wind uh, blowing in one direction. Um, so that's a little deviation that we have here. That means that the, it's the, the equation is unbalanced there, and uh, that might uh, give us, um, actually, it implies a realistic rate growth. So when we have that, um, normally you have this uh, diagnostic tail uh, proportional to F25 um, to the minus 5 that is applied to bring it back. You know, after uh, FC or a critical, let's call it a critical frequency that's computed as a factor times the mean uh, when C uh, uh, frequency. Normally we use 2.5 here. Uh, although this will correct the red weird tail that we have here, uh, it does have some um, side effects, uh, which is mainly um, the directional distribution uh, has the same shape of all along directions and uh, the same direction and same directional uh, spread for all frequencies above that uh, that I call for a critical or threshold uh, frequency. So that's an uh, extra motivation to look for something better. And uh, as um, Leonel mentioned before, there are some particular um, characteristics of um, this parameterization that uh, helps a lot into solving uh, some of these issues. I'm not going to go into details because uh, Leonel already explained everything. So there's nothing else to say here. Let's go into the um, into the test on into the playing with this uh, uh, parameterization once we plug it into ST into the ST4 parameterization. Um, we test different uh, main parameters here included in the um, in the expression of dissipation, and we played with the DIN and the uh, WRT method too. Um, so let's see some of the, this. Uh, in the figure on the left panel here, you have on A and C the um, uh, how is it called? Um, the inverse um, dissipation time scale, or in other words, how long it takes for the source to introduce changes into the spectrum. Okay, uh, we sliced uh, two examples at uh, two different frequencies at 0 0.5 and 1 uh, hertz, and then um, B and D. This is just a slice of the uh, the G spectrum to the original spectrum. Okay, so now that in A and C, in A and C, how the ST4 and ST6 have uh, pretty much um, the same, uh, it, it acts, the dissipation acts at the combination of the um, nonlinear interactions and the dissipation acts in the same way across all directions, which is something that I've not mentioned before. And actually that is uh, what keeps uh, kind of a narrow spectrum. While with the, uh, what we call here T700, which is actually uh, Romero 2019, it's uh, pretty much localized in, uh, let's say, in the neighborhood of the downwind direction, which allows to uh, have this leakage or the spreading of energy toward direction. And most, I guess, most most dramatic or more more interesting is to see the clear bimodality that it generates at higher uh, frequencies here in the panel D. So um, yeah. Some differences. We tried to plug in also the cumulative term um, that I explained before here from the longer waves, hitting the small ones, to see what kind of changes would it uh, um, introduce here. And this is what we see in the cyan test here. So we kind of like, we see the effect that it's similar to what's uh, the effect that's happening in the ST4 parameterization here. Um, <coughs> Sorry, here at, uh, I wanted to show the differences uh, detected when the WRT method is used to, uh, together with T uh, seven hundred, and I guess uh, the most important um, thing to show are from panel, uh, panel B and D here on the right uh, figure. When the full nonlinear interaction is used, uh, there is a narrower, narrower and more sharp directional distribution in the spectral energy, which is actually something that uh, Leonel already showed too, and. Um, I guess it's easier to see here to visualize that here when uh, we have the original um, 
T700 uh, just with the DIA here versus all the rest of the tests that we're playing with uh, when we use the WT method here. You have a super sharp and clear uh, by, uh, yeah, by modality here of the spectrum. Um, yeah, let's see some other indicators. Um, let's pay attention to the uh, saturation spectrum and the overlap integral that um, it's used to quantify the amount of energy in opposite uh, directions. So, and the figure from the left, particularly uh, the testing color cyan again, this one, it's uh, pretty much uh, a continuation of what I, of what I was uh, uh, talking here. So, if you see here in the saturation spectrum, uh, saturation spectrum after um, you know the 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 uh, the system is quite developed, uh, uh, most of the tests have this crazy tail going up. So. Uh, which doesn't happen in ST4, of course, because it's forced, as I mentioned before, to, to stay down. So trying a little bit to uh, introduce that effect without an, an actual diagnostic tail, uh, we introduced back the, uh, the cumulative term, uh, which helped actually, which you see here, to bring that little tail and have the uh, F to the minus uh, five um, uh, shape there in high frequencies. But uh, we see that it has some side effects uh, really, see values of the overlapping material here that are really not really doesn't say much and also some oscillations as uh, in the ratio of the mean square slopes as uh, the system develops in time here so well it's uh, pros and cons there um, and again I think uh, Leonel also mentioned that this uh, tails uh, happening going up with the WRT method which we are also observing here in, in all in our different tests even when we apply the cumulative term from the previous parameterization, we still have that little going up that's happening there. Um, to go back to um, something global and, and to link it to the first three slides that I was showing, we uh, did a similar analysis plugging in this uh, dissipation parameterization, uh, just like it's uh, it was done in Romero 2019. And I just applied a little tweaking of the swell dissipation and um, and the wind wave uh, growth uh, parameter to uh, let's say uh, to bring the uh, performance of the global um, simulation of wave heights close to what we had uh, before in in in, in T four seventy five, uh, which was pretty good. So we were trying to get everything back there to what where we thought it was a, a decent um, performance of the model. We still have. A lot to do probably there uh, from the little tests that I performed. I didn't really manage to correct this. I guess the rest is pretty much the same or with slightly higher bias here. But I, again, that's uh, an ongoing uh, process to adapt that. But here, I'm, yeah, there's some, I find it more um, tricky to uh, reduce the differences of the um, underestimation of wave heights in the neighborhood of uh, the two meters wave heights, which are the the, the more uh, the most uh, frequent ones uh, globally. Uh, what else? Um, yeah, so I prepared some basin scale tests to compare the uh, CCA evolution at um, at this void, the 46 to 46. And the main reason that I consider just I consider just this uh, basin um, model, it's because we were using the WRT uh, method too for the nonlinear interactions and like do it globally, globally it would have taken too long. And uh, so it was uh, kind of like a time constraint there to have a proper uh, development of the C state. And so we perform like a five day spin up here to have a clean run of seven days where we can actually see what's going on. And these are the uh, results or the kind of like interesting results that I got from these tests. Um, we have, um, these figures will show the evolution of the saturation spectrum and the mean spread at each frequency uh, from four set of stats, tests. Uh, the T700 with the DIA and the WRT, and again, the T700 with uh, Leonel's uh, post parameters from, from that paper, and the T475 test with DIA and WRT, so pretty straightforward. Uh, <clears throat> in each panel, you have a three hour averaged. Um, values uh, for these uh, different uh, quantities, okay, trying to kind of uh, make a brief of the evolution of the C state. 
Uh, there are some similarities in the saturation spectrum between parameterizations at that very early stage of the uh, WinC development, which is uh, probably expected. Uh, but know that the T700 develops um, the F to the minus five tail using the DIA, where no commutative term is used and no diagnostic tail is used either here. So it kind of takes longer than the T475 because, of course, it's based on the classic ST4. Mark one uh, at all 2010, so that one goes faster down, and this one progressively, you know, it builds to the um, kind of the F to the minus five um, tail. What else is interesting here? Um, yeah, so overall, the saturation differences are happening at um, higher frequencies that we see here, uh, which is also expected because of the way that this parameterization is formulated, but uh, since uh, with my the board that I was using, we have like uh, weird values in the well, in, in frequency higher than oh, 0.5 uh, hertz. I can't really see much uh, with this, so definitely we need to use some uh, different kind of measurements to kind of like analyze what's going on there. Uh, when it comes to the rational spreading down here, uh, it is easier to state that there's a clear improvement with uh, a T700. Uh, it was already seen with the Point wise cases, they are the idealized cases. And actually, I don't know one uh, a lot into more detail uh, about how the, uh, the distribution of the energy it kind of like bifurcates at a higher frequency. So it's expected to see an improvement of these uh, parameters. Um, still good agreement with the DIA, but uh, I'm seeing that normally I have a higher uh, spread actually that it's not seen with the WRT. Um, I'm actually pretty like impressed by how uh, good it uh, goes once the, uh, the, um, the system is being uh, well developed here. Uh, something to add in this test, in this um, example, uh, I picked this time window because the wind was constantly uh, growing up and it was a pretty much steady direction. So it was a, a pretty good test case to do it in the basin scale uh, example. Um, to wrap it up, let's uh, take something home from this. So that's a clear increase of the directional energy distribution using this parameterization uh, with improvements, uh, improvements on directional spreading compared to measurements and with clear uh, directional bimodality high frequencies. So that's uh, something super interesting to see, actually. Uh, the global uh, wave heights after some wave growth and swell dissipation adjustments are similar to those of the T475 or the uh, Lyotel paper from 2021. Still, some adjustments should be done there. I guess the trans energy transference to lower frequencies might affect somehow the swell dissipation. So that's why you need to kind of like maybe compensate some other parameters there. It's also worth mentioning that the T700 without using any cumulative term requires significantly less CPU time. So that's a pro also. Uh, probably the wave growth of the spectrum is still not completely balanced from what we've seen from the idealized cases and also in this uh, comparison with uh, uh, with buoy uh, in the basin scale uh, model. And finally, the weight breaking parameterization by Romero 2019 is an interesting alternative to, um, you know, for some applications like acoustic uh, data correlations, which is something that uh, we've been working on uh, lately. And it's already super nice to see that we actually have correlations now uh, comparing to acoustic data. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Matthias. And uh, we will open it up uh, to questions. Uh, so again, uh, feel free to use the raise your hand button um, or the chat and I already see a hand up. So uh, Paolo, go ahead. Uh, we can't hear you yet, Paolo. You need to, you need to unmute yourself, Paolo. Mm, yep, does it work now? Hello. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, so the question is for, for, for both. Uh, this is, mm, we have this old, uh, not so old issue uh, with uh, Peter Janssen has been working on that for, for, for a few years. And, you know, when, when we compute all these diagnostics, uh, mean square slopes and basically the mean periods, if we don't take into account maybe the, the second order spectrum, we don't get the right answers, especially with respect to buoys. Um, yeah, so this is basically, I haven't seen much 
much work in the last years about that, and I'm just curious of the um, of the contribution of this uh, of this part, right? At least in the in the diagnosis, not in the um, not in the. I see that some of the search functions that you're using are taking into account the mean square slopes, mm -hmm. uh, and and this could be something very difficult to do because you have to compute the second order spectrum and put this into the into your source function. But uh, yeah, so it's uh, diagnosis of mean square slopes and comparison with with buoys, especially at high frequencies where where the buoys maybe are not dancing with the waves. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I guess you're right. I mean, uh, but you know, like the logic says that you need to like, chew by chunks. So I guess like it's a logic next step to jump into that as long uh, as well as um, other sources of, of measurements, acoustics, uh, underwater acoustics, uh, seismic noise. And yeah, I, I guess I, you're completely right. And I guess the first step is verification with all these different uh, ways of measurement. Uh, I don't know, Leonel, if you have uh, done something with that before. Uh, no, I, I haven't looked at the second order. I, I did for a long time when I was looking at statistics. I haven't looked at it for the mean square slope and what would be for this particular spectra, but it's a good question. Again, for probably next things to do, include that. Yeah, let's do it because... <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Do we have any other questions? So I have a question. Um, being at an operational center, uh, reducing the computational time is always uh, something that makes my eyes light up. Um, do you have a reasoning um, for why you think that the computational speed is so much faster? Uh, it is basically <laughs> the easiest uh, answer here. It's um, because the um, cumulative term that one, uh, where is it? That one there takes uh, quite a long time to compute. That's why, because of the integral thing. Um, yeah, it's just an extra step that takes a long time. And if you take it out, of course, like it rolls a lot faster. Yeah. I think, I think, uh, uh, I, Fabrice, you can correct me. I think uh, Jean Bidlow actually removed that term from the uh, ST4 packages uh, implemented in the ECMWF system. So to actually make it faster, so. Yes, yeah, IFE is equal one uh, uh, version of ECM1, uh, EC1 uh, has this, uh, all this stuff without this extra loop and that actually with the, the cost of the um, SDS in ST4 uh, is actually much higher than the DIA because of that crazy loop, which actually is a bit silly because if actually you actually look at what it does, it's almost isotropic effect. So it, it could be parameterized uh, fairly accurately in a much more simple way. So that's something we could do. Uh, and having a, as a tuning extra parameter also for Romero to be able to remove some of the energy that goes opposite to the wind. So that's one possibility. We actually looked at one, uh, one measurement in the, in the Black Sea done with uh, um, Alvise and, and, and a stereo video system that was uh, in the Leclerc et al. A JPO paper that looked at the uh, linear wave plus a second order spectrum. And you can actually see that, yeah, for stereo video, uh, in the F spectrum, it's very important. So a buoy filters a little bit of the nonlinearities, but not everything. So I would suspect that yes, the, the very high saturation for the buoys at high frequency, even, even though it's a wave rider and not a, a, a three meter discus buoy, that could be indeed due to the second order spectrum. And then Fabrice, it sounded like you, or you have your hand raised. So did you have another question as well? Nope, that was it. All right, do we have uh, any questions for either of the speakers? Or any questions on uh, wave dissipation um, and this parameterization, um, maybe opening it up to 
what our next steps. Um, I guess it was clear enough for everyone. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, so I'm just going to very quickly um, remind everybody about our uh, next seminar. I'm trying to pull up uh, the date here very quickly. Apologize, I don't have it up already. Um, so our next seminar uh, will be on Rogue Waves on November the 30th. Uh, so look out for the announcements for that. Um, thank you everyone uh, for joining and we will see you next time. And thank you again to our two speakers, Lionel and uh, Matthias. Thanks, Jessica. Thanks yeah, for organizing. Nice seeing you, Leonel. Yeah, good to see you. I, 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 I